what's going on? Uh, I'm DJ. And I'm Udik. And we're here at the Creative Collective on our Tech Check Night with Brendan Curtis. What's going on, man? Uh, not much. We're just ready to go into a Lightroom tutorial. He's going to show us some post-process on how he goes through some of his photos. Um, can you give us kind of an overview of everything that you're going to be going through? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to be going over uh, different metering modes in the camera, how to use them, and then just a general workflow of editing. All right. Go for it, man. Cool. All right, so there's two metering modes that are important in your camera. One is general metering, which isn't actually what it's called. I don't remember what it's actually called. And it doesn't really matter because every camera company calls it a different thing. But it meters, it meters for the whole scene. So everything in this square, uh, rectangle, everything that the sensor reads, it's going to read everything that's seeing. Does that make sense? So this is a photo taken uh, a photo in general metering mode. Yeah, this is a photo taken in general metering mode okay. where it's metering for the whole scene. And you can, as you can tell, her face is obviously way too dark. Um, and that emphasizes shadows under her eyes and the shadows. And it's her hair is properly exposed because it's exposing for the highlight. Because um, most of this is, I was shooting into the sun. So most of this is very bright. Uh, but if you go to spot metering mode in your camera, which, which is, I think it's called spot metering in most camera companies, it's a general spot that you choose, whether it's like in the middle, whether you do the middle point or a point off to the side, up, down, left, right, anywhere in the frame that you can choose a point, it'll expose for that point that you're on. So if you put that point on her eye and expose for her face and her eye, then it's going to expose the picture, or it's going to tell the meter what to say. So in this picture, I am at ISO 100, 50 millimeters. Yeah, I, I have the f1.2. I know, it's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, can you say I what shot, camera model you're using and oh, also is, lens? This is the Canon 7D Mark II as well. Um, but I shot with a Canon 50 millimeter f1.8 forever. That was actually my first uh, Canon DSLR lens. The plastic fantastic Nifty 50. <laughs> Love the Nifty 50. Shout out to you guys at Canon. Thank you for that $100 lens. You've saved our lives over the years. It's well worth more than 100 bucks. Um, so this, the meter told me to shoot at 8,000th of a second, which is clearly not right. Um, if, if you put it in spot metering and you meter for her face, it's going to meter for her skin tone. And it's going to bring the meter to ISO 150 millimeters. F1.2 at 2,000th of a second instead, which is, uh, I believe, two stops more light. So it's letting in twice as much light. Look at that beautiful histogram. Love oh, it. Oh, yeah. And so now it's exposing for her skin. And, uh, I can't really tell on the screen. Yeah. Well, it's actually a little bit under still, but, but that's easy to fix. It's about half a stop under still. So you just go over to exposure and you put it up half half a stop and looks pretty good from there, you know? Looks nice, man. Looks really nice. So I'm pretty sure every camera has a, uh, a metering settings mode on their camera, right? I mean... Yeah. Uh, unless you go back to really old school analog film cameras from the 40s and 50s, <laughs> pretty much every camera has a meter in it. That's good Or has know. an option for a meter. And this is just another example. It's it's exposing, uh, the general metering is exposing for the whole scene. So it did expose some of the bird because there is a lot of dark on the side, but it didn't expose it properly because there's a lot of bright over here too. So if you go into spot metering and you put that spot on the bird, you do lose detail in the leaves, but you actually gain a lot more detail in the bird, which is a lot more important than the leaves that aren't even in focus. Right, which just kind of goes back to what we were talking about on the... Uh on the tech check talk where we're talking about, you know, the subject of the photo and telling a story. Uh, like in the past, I'd probably say all oh, those, you know, in your, your underexposed shot, the leaves look really nice, but the reality is the bird's the subject of the, fo the photo. So yeah, that's exactly. what you really want to expose for because that's what's telling the story. Yep. It's great. And then same for this. This is also backlit. These are all backlit because that's the most common problem people have is shooting into light. Um, the meter becomes very stupid at that point and just meters for all the highlights. So this is metering for all the highlights in the 
the sun bouncing off the water and everything. Yeah, the outline of the duck is really nice and it's properly exposed and everything, but but you don't see any of the duck basically. If you go, these aren't exactly the same shot because ducks don't really stand still, but but um, that is one see, beautiful duck. It's a lot more detailed. <laughs> like you zoom in, there's be beautiful feather detail. You can see even the some of the skin flaking off his beak. And inside his nose. I can even see the reflection in his eye. That is unreal. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I love the reflection in the light in the eye. Oh, also something very important is having catch light in the eyes. This isn't a really good example, but see this bright spot? If As long as you have a bright spot in the eye, it gives it a lot more life than, mm. like even if I bring this up, oh, it has a little bit of a catch eye, or eye ca catch light, but see how it's not really as prominent as that one not a very good example but no that's actually um can you go back to the underexposed yeah. and uh bring it back to like its original exposure yeah and then uh bring it up to what would be proper oh proper exposure yeah um let me see. basically as close as you can get it to what you just had yeah it's it's probably about two stops and then can you zoom in to what you basically just did yeah because i i just saw the I mean, you can start to see a little bit of grain, but this is kind of a, a good example of from a uh, post process. If you underexpose and you're trying to fix your problems in post, uh, when you underexpose, the consequences of that. So, because you were kind of talking earlier about uh, making sure that you get it right in camera first, so you're really just only doing minor adjustments in post, you're, but exactly. you're trying to get the right shot in camera yeah, first. Yeah, because if I switch between these two, like you said, I'm trying to match them up as best as I can here, but. See how there isn't much detail in this one, uh, just because I think it's a little out of focus. I think it missed focus. It looks like the beak's a little more in focus. But even the beak, if you uh, zoom into the beak on this one, look how grainy yeah, it is. Yeah, so dirty and the, the details Because I brought it up two lost. stops. I increased the exposure by two stops instead of doing it manually in camera, and look how much cleaner it is. So even with the quality of like glass and the lens that Brendan was using and the camera, um, when you try to bring up an underexposed photo and post, you're still going to get the same consequences on most any cameras. So um, I'm really glad that you showed that. Yeah. That was good. Yeah, and then uh, you just want me to go through some general editing? Yeah, go for yeah. it, man. Okay. Fire away. All right, I think that's out of focus. Nope, that's good. Um, this is just general wide shot. Um, I actually cheated a little bit, and I got a strobe over on this side, <laughs> over up here. Um, just because I wanted to... Wait, where did you say the strobe was? It's up about... It's a little out of frame over here, right where I'm moving the mouse. So it's kind of like you faked uh, sun reflection? Yeah, I mean, side. you can do the same thing with a, a $20 reflector. It just... I didn't really have a... It's my mom. My mom was holding the C-stand to make sure it doesn't <laughs> nice. fall over. Bringing the family together. Yeah, there was a little bit of a flip out before this, so... <laughs> um... um uh, just for the the techies out there, can you give some tech specs for the shot? Oh yeah, um, lens bottle. Oh, you know what? Here, where where is it? There you go. So. Oh, nice. You should be able to see it a little better here. Uh, two thousands of a second, f one four ISO one hundred. This is the twenty millimeter art uh, by Sigma. It's and uh, really what cool body lens. are you using? Uh, this is the five D Mark three. Nice. Yeah, I broke out the the toys for this one because I kind of owed my sister a photo shoot anyway so I figured I'd get these two over with at one shot and one shoot whatever but um yeah I mean it's an okay picture you know it's technically correct and everything there's not a lot of creativity going on but try to add in the building a little bit you know there's a lot more than the than this one that's a little bit more interesting she, her pose is a little weird but I like the composition it's nice yeah rule of thirds breaking it down into nine pieces and you put it on the intersecting lines. I wish I could show that, but I don't have Get like the a grid drawing on there. thing. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Oh, nice. There you go. Yeah, it's a that's of the rule of thirds right there. So she's pretty much on the top right third intersecting area. Oh, that's great. But um, yeah, let's see. Um, generally, I add contrast first. And you see it takes some of the shadows and darkens them and it increases the highlights. Now, 
this photo before I added contrast was a little bit under on her face, just a little bit too much shadow. So if I had gone and added a couple stops or half a stop, it makes it better. But you lose a lot of detail in the other parts of the mm -hmm. area, other parts of the photo. So that's why I always do contrast first, because the contrast does up the exposure slightly on the highlights, but on the shadows, it also brings the shadows down. That's what adds contrast. Contrast is just the difference between the brightest and the darkest, or essentially white and black in uh, old school black and white film days. Do you have a max on how high you'll bring the contrast on a photo? Is there a point where you're starting to like, lose color about, detail? I usually put it about 50. Uh, plus 50. This is just a random click, so uh, if I feel that it's too much contrast, I'll pull it off it a little bit, or I usually add um, shadows, so you can bring out some of the shadow detail, but you keep some of the contrast still a little bit. Hmm. So, you see, like, like that's without it, and that's with it. It brings a little bit more detail into her hair, into her shirt. You can see the lines in, uh, in her shirt from the when it was made and everything. And then uh, I generally don't touch clarity, uh, but for wide shots I do. I usually do plus five, plus 10 max, just because it makes it look a little grungy if you go any higher than five or 10, in my opinion. And then saturation and vibrance, just a little bit, add a little color to it. For this photo, this, this lens is very contrasty, so sometimes you actually don't even need to add, uh, or it produces nice colors rather than contrast. I mean, it does have nice contrast too, though. And then sharpening, uh, I'll usually go to sharpening after that. And the, a trick with the masking tool, if you hold Alt Option on a Mac, and then I think it's still Option on a PC, right? Uh, nobody here uses I have PCs, no idea. do they? Is it still Option? Or do they have an Option button or Alt? Uh, I'm pretty sure. Alt, like it's yeah. Anyways, it's it, it, irrelevant. <laughs> um, if you hold down that button and you press the, you hold the masking slider, everything in white is going to get sharpened. It makes people look terrifying, but <laughs> everything in white is going to get sharpened and everything in black isn't going to get touched. So that's how you can use the masking slider to tell what you're sharpening and what you're not sharpening. So, so what, if you what, leave what's it, the keys that you're holding down one more time? Um, it, on the Mac, it is option it, between the control and command key. And then what else? Um, and then you're just grabbing the masking slider underneath sharpening. Oh, okay. And you pull it in, or you start increasing it, and the more and more you do, the less it's going to sharpen. So before, see how, like, uh, I added sharpening, and there's extra grain in her cheek? Mm. If you go forward and you do the masking, it keeps the detail on the edges, but it takes away the grain in the cheek. No, that's great. Because it's not sharpening the cheek. Okay. You can see her eyes are popping a lot more, but yeah. um, the, her, her face still has like the soft complexion that you want. Yep. That's great. That's just, that's pretty much generally what I do. Um, oh yeah, actually, the, usually the very, very first thing I do is white balance. And this is just general daylight, so we'll add a little bit to it. And uh, I think I was actually shooting in cloudy um, white balance, so it actually made it a little... So this is a little bit different for video because I usually white balance is a crucial aspect that I want to get right when it comes oh, to yeah, video. Oh yeah, definitely. Because uh, transferring the color information, because I'm usually, I mean, when it comes to photos, there's a lot more information in one. Uh, but for a video sequence, uh, you know, the less I have wrong on the camera, um, getting it back to square one uh, in uh, post is so much harder. So. Uh, how how big of a priority is white balance for you on the field? Is are, are you really worried about that, or are you just trying to get approximate and you know you'll be able to correct the color in post? Well, with RAW, I always shoot RAW. Um, it's a bigger file, and there's more detail and you can bring out of it. But the great thing is you can um, adjust the white balance to any white balance you want in post-production and not have any detail loss or grain increase or anything like that. With Like what DJ said, with video... You have to get it right because you can't do that um, with video unless you have an extremely expensive camera that can shoot right. raw, like raw 4K or whatever. Um, but imagine video is basically just shooting in JPEG. You got to get it right. There's no, 
there's not really too much leniency in post-production you have. Mm. But even uh, in this photo, the last thing I'd probably check after I adjust everything to expose for the subject properly, um, the building's a little distracting. So I'd probably bring down the highlights a little bit or a lot of it, mostly. <laughs> um, yeah, right about there, it looks, looks better. Not as distracting. Um, not a very good example, because you usually don't have a giant white building with sun hitting it in the background of your photos. Let's go to a portrait um, with less in there. Yeah, we can do the one of her in front of the tree. Yeah, like this. See, there's a lot less distracting elements in the background. It's just nice bokeh or whatever. The light coming through the trees. And the exposure is pretty dead on for this. So if I do increase the contrast, it's probably going to make her face a little too bright, actually. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I see a problem, I go to fix it a little bit and pull back on that highlight, con uh, the highlight slider a little bit and it brings it back in. She doesn't look like she's pale as a ghost anymore. <laughs> it's, uh, and a good way to tell if your skin's exposed properly is zoom in one to one. Because like you see here, it's like almost blindingly white. And then you bring it back in and it brings a little bit more detail in. A lot of people will shoot, a lot of fashion designers and fashion magazines will shoot high key because it's a lot easier to edit, which means that they overexpose the skin yeah, well, it's a generally overexposed image because if you, even if you just bring up the exposure on here, look how much detail you lose in the face because the models don't have any detail on their face anyways in magazines, you know? Mm. It doesn't matter to them, but uh, fun fact, yeah. So what would you say, so when you said uh, zoom in and look at it, you said one to one, what does that mean? Oh, one to one means zoomed in as far as you can zoom in. Oh, okay. So like over on the side here, up here, um, I have it on fit, which means it'll fit the photo in the frame. If you click on one to one or you just click with the mouse, it'll zoom in one to one. See how it's highlighted now, one to one? Gotcha. Um, it, that's a really good way to tell if you're sharpening too much or if there's not enough details in the blacks or not enough detail in the highlights. You can zoom in and adjust to that and then you can zoom out and it's a lot more accurate usually. But I mean, uh, there's really not too much I do to this photo. It looks pretty solid anyways. Um, technically correct. Not a whole lot of creativity. I just threw a tree behind her and stood her in front of the tree. No, that's great. I mean, she's, it's a portrait, so yeah. she's a subject. But um, something really important is you always want to have some sort of catch light. Like, see, this is my flash in the eye and it gives a lot more light, uh, life to the eyes. Uh, I could spend forever editing this out of it and then show you, but you're gonna have to take my word for it because it's mm. too much time consuming. No, that's a really good point though. Like in the, I think it was the location shot with the White House, it was the, the side of the, the house was kind of drawing your attention because of how blown out white it was. Yeah. And I think just having some type of, you know, micro ref reflection inside the eyes helps you just draw your eyes to the subject that much more. Yeah, here's uh, actually an example. This is one I shot with natural light with no, no fill flash or anything. And, you know, it's a nice picture. There's not a lot of detail in her face, but um, it's slightly out of focus, actually. But you see how there's almost no life to her eyes? Where you switch to this photo and her eyes just pop. Even in this one, even in full, the full photo, it's like, you know, it's a nice photo. It's, it's good, but there's no life to it, you know? Even in a photo like this where it's a faraway shot, um, having catch light in the eye is going to be noticeable, um, especially if you make a print or something. Just because, like, the full shot of this, not much bigger than this shot, look how much more noticeable her eyes are. A lot more life to the photo, and it gives you more of her personality. And see, in this one, she kind of just seems, you know, not, not lack of a better word, dead, lifeless, lifeless. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, 
one time we met up and you said kind of uh, a coined quote about the uh, the eyes and the subject. Uh, oh yeah, the eyes are the doors. Uh, a couple of different ways of saying it, but the eyes are the doors to the soul. Yeah, so it's um, sort of a, it's like the eyes are the lamp of the heart. So uh, just two different ways of saying it, but that's a really good point. That um, I mean, you can clearly see in the contrast between those two photos because uh, this is a really nice composed photo, um, positioning, the framing, everything. But um, you can just tell that there's something. It's not drawing you in. And I think um, a huge part of that is um, getting those eyes active and whatever you need to do that. So what, what's some techniques that you've used in the past to be able to, to bring the eyes to the life? Well, um, a lot of it has to do with fill light. So if you have a reflector and you bring a reflector in front of them, if, say your light source is behind them, and you bring a reflector and you fill in a little bit light, it it really helps fill in the shadows and everything, and it makes it look nice, but it's also gonna give a little catch light in the bottom of their eye, mm. depending on, I'm oh, sorry, I should, depending on where you're holding the reflector above, below, at the chest line, or, um, or you can get really technical and introduce flash to it, but you can do pretty much anything you can do with a, a flash, you can do with a reflector, uh, portrait-wise. You can fill in shadows, you can fill in and make a catch light. Um, you don't even need to have a direct sunlight either. You can, uh, you can be in a cloudy situation and still bounce light. It works. I've seen it. I've done it. It works. That's pretty much it. If anyone has any questions watching this or in the audience, the massive audience. Um, <laughs> um, any questions? Feel free to feel free to ask me next time you see me or send me a Facebook message or something if you have a question. Yeah, where where, where can they find you? Where oh, you have uh, on social media? I'm on Facebook, Brendan Curtis, um, or you can look at my any of my social media, which is Moments Suspended in Time. Uh, on Instagram, it's it's uh, with underscores between the words, and my website is Moments Suspended in Time dot com. So. Feel free to check it out and take a gander. I've got a lot of cool photos on there. Awesome. Thanks again so much for your time, Brennan. I really appreciate Thank it. You. It's fun. <laughs>